right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And this week is particularly exciting because this is Oceans Week. So in collaboration with the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, Ocean Networks Canada, and more fantastic organizations coast to coast to coast across this country, we are featuring an eight-part epic program series featuring some of Canada's top explorers and scientists, and there is no better person to kick that off with us than Jill Heiner. She is one of the original people involved with Exploring by the Seeger Pants years ago when we were founded. She is one of our favorite speakers here as an organization, and she is probably the world's foremost explorer. Certainly no one has done more to uh, elucidate the world of water, both the veins of Mother Earth, the oceans, lakes, rivers, all across this planet than Jill. She has been featured and lauded by pretty much every exploration and scientific organization you can shake a stick at, and it is such a pleasure and privilege to have her with us today. Before I dive in with her, I just want to bring up our quick website here, uh, exploringbytheseat.com slash oceanweek. If you want to see our full lineup of programs, check that out, or just head to our YouTube channel. The moment we go live with any program, it's there, and they all remain up forever. A lot of questions about that, so I want to make sure all you teachers are prepped to watch in as we continue to showcase cool people around Canada. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jill to blow your minds. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Jill. I'm so excited to hear about your work, your books, and more, and uh, take us away. All right, my pleasure. Thanks so much, Jesse, and, and happy Oceans Week to everyone, World Oceans Week. We're all celebrating and uh, learning about protecting and conserving these precious water resources. Today, I'm gonna take you on a journey around Canada's four coasts. Now, I know you hear C3 quite a bit, but I like to think of it as C4, uh, because we have the Arctic, we have the Atlantic, we have the Pacific, but I also think of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence watershed as a coast as well, because if you travel that entire watershed um, from end to end, it's farther than going across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I'm calling in from Ontario today. Whoops, let me, uh, sorry, I just uh, slipped on my slide there. I'm calling in from Ontario today, and I grew up uh, on Lake Ontario. I live now near Ottawa, Canada, and I was an absolute lover of water from as long as I can remember, and that has inspired me to turn it into a career. So today my career takes me all around the world, uh, generally with a camera in my hand, uh, exploring and documenting underwater spaces. My specialty being underwater cave systems. But you might find me in some pretty unusual places like the Sahara Desert, because there are even places to dive there. And uh, although you might not think of scuba diving, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, but you will find me working in Canada's high Arctic on top of Lancaster Sound here, or even swimming into a volcanic lava tube in a volcano in the Canary Islands. But like I said, my happy place is inside underwater caves because that's where I'm swimming through the veins of Mother Earth. So one thing I want you to think about today is the fact that no matter where you live, even if you're like in the middle of a landlocked space in Canada, everything you do on the surface of the Earth can soak into the ground, end up in places like this, or just end up in between the grains of sand, and that water always moves towards lower places, and it ends up in the ocean. So your activities on the surface of the earth can affect your drinking water as well as the world's oceans. So in Canada, we are particularly blessed because we have more than 200,000 kilometers of coastline. 8% of the cover of our landscape has lakes on it. We have 9% of the world's freshwater and only half a percent of the global population. One of these days, I'm going to need to do a calculation of how long all the shorelines of the lakes and rivers in Canada are because I think that number would be staggering. 
So let me start in the Arctic, because uh, this is a place that I really, really love to go. Um, the Arctic, as you know, is a very changing landscape these days. So what you're looking at here is an aerial image of sea ice at its, as it's setting up. So in the fall and into the winter, there are large areas of the Arctic that are completely covered by sea ice. And that sea ice is what the Inuit people refer to as the land. Because as you can see, the land itself, like what many of us think of as, as land, is really hard to move around on. But the sea ice itself is flat and it can connect communities and families and allow for cultural practices like traditional hunting. So they think of the ice as the land and the land is in trouble in the Arctic because we're losing sea ice cover and it's getting thinner and the extent of it is smaller and smaller. It's melting earlier and setting uh, our, and setting up um, later each year. Now, this is what you would see if you're underwater underneath the sea ice. So it's not just like, you know, an ice cube you see in a drink. You've got living organisms attached to the sea ice, and these organisms are fueled by the sunlight, and they really form the base of the food chain. So where do we dive in the Arctic? Well, we move around on top of the land on the sea ice, and we sometimes go to places like this. This is actually a seal's breathing hole. So he's used his claws to like cut a hole in the ice so he can pop his little head up and uh, breathe air from above the ice and then disappear back down for a while. So we find these holes all over the landscape in the north. It's pretty cool. And you'll see a bunch in a general area where different family members from a seal family will pop up to breathe. We also dive at places like this. This is an iceberg that's actually come all the way from Greenland. It's come across the Davis Strait and gotten frozen into the sea ice in the winter. And um, in the springtime, in the early summer, when the ice breaks up, that iceberg will head down the east coast of Canada. But there's some open water spots that different animals use as breathing holes or hunting places, but we also dive there. So that's our sled and all our dive gear there. We also dive in open leads in the ice, so natural fractures. When the ice is breaking apart and separating, we can dive in there. And you'll see um, some of our Inuit guides here holding tethers that are attached to us so we don't get swept away in the current. Underneath, you can see that that crack is very square, and that's the natural ice cracking there. Now, this is what we call the flow edge. So where the sea ice meets open water at the ocean, that leading edge of the ice changes every day as it breaks up. Sometimes it's sort of like rough and broken up like this. And on other days, it's very straight like this. So you've got ocean and you've got ice. And that moves miles per day as it breaks up in the spring and summer. It's not often that we get these beautiful calm waters like that. Um, although we do get calm waters on top of the ice, like back at our camping spot, that's usually like somewhere between 40 and 80 kilometers away from the flow edge because it's moving so quickly. On a good day on the flow edge, we get to see beluga whales and narwhals right up against the ice because they're hunting and they're surfacing, breathing up and then going out under the ice for sometimes 10, 11, 12 minutes before we see them again popping up at the flow edge. But these days, as the ice is melting, there's a lot of water on top of the ice. We have rainstorms. We have challenging transportation moving through these icy environments. It's getting more and more dangerous and more and more difficult to set up base camps in these places. Um, but that's the best way for us to be up close and personal uh, with the wildlife. But at times, I have to move my tent because as you can see right here, um, overnight we had rainstorms and my tent has many inches of water in it, almost right up to where my cot level is. So I had to move it. That in the other corner there is the Arctic bathroom. We actually use five gallon buckets for toilets because we've got to take every bit of waste um, that we create 
off of this area so it doesn't end up in the ocean. So we wanna keep everything clean. Here's underwater again, looking at a natural fracture in the ice and some of the algal growth underneath the ice, that algal growth that's fueling the base of the food chain. Underwater, we see so many fantastic things um, from small animals like jellyfish that are fascinating to look at to very big animals as well. And here's me with my tether there attached to my shoulder underneath the ice for some filming activities. Now, as I look up the side of an iceberg from underwater, you see kelp on the seafloor and then you see the beautiful sculptural qualities of the ice there. It's very, very pretty. And this is what the scene is like topside out of the water. So these are really stunningly beautiful environments, both topside and here's underneath on this one. And if you just follow my finger a little bit further over, you see a very small smudge. That's my dive buddy. And that gives you a sense of the size of this particular iceberg. So later in the summer in the Arctic, when more of the ice is broken up and gone, we dive in other parts of the Arctic out of uh, a canoe, <laughs> okay? And uh, we have a chance to camp uh, on the land, the land land, instead of on the ice in this case. Um, and this is at a place where we're actually filming polar bears and walruses. It's a very active area, um, White Island near Nauyat, Nunavut. So I was the first person, the first woman to jump in the water with wild polar bears to film them in the water for a recent CBC documentary. And I will tell you that it is terrifying and I don't know whether I'll ever do it again, <laughs> but I'm really glad I had an opportunity to get these Im images of these absolutely magnificent animals. Um, having the opportunity to film um, this bear and um, I didn't get in the water with her because she had two cubs with her and I didn't want to disturb her. But to give you a sense of the size, that's a polar bear footprint and that's my hand over there. So they're pretty huge. Now you might think that that's the most dangerous thing in the Arctic waters, but my diving colleague, Mario Sear is actually a little more afraid of walruses. Um, now walruses, they don't eat people. I mean, they like to eat um, clams and things like that and dig them out with their big tusks. But their tusks are what they can use to defend themselves if they feel threatened. And I sure wouldn't want to get hit in the head with one of those. <laughs> so here's a mama walrus, a mother with two young babies, and she's teaching them to hunt and dig for clams. We know it's a mother because her, her tusks come out like this as opposed to straight down. So her tusks come out because she cradles her babies when they can't swim fast enough and she nurses them. So her tusks, uh, they don't want to be in the way. So here's a caribou smile for you and we'll move on down the coast of Labrador from Baffin Island through Torngat National Park, where we can follow the course of the icebergs that break up as the sea ice breaks up. So these large pieces of ice move down the east coast of Canada um, through Labrador. And as they do, the wind and the waves continue to sculpt these big pieces of ice. And as that happens, they change shape and as they change shape, sometimes they destabilize and roll. And that helps to sculpt them into these beautiful shapes as well before they completely melt back into the ocean again. We've seen icebergs reach as far south as Bermuda, but most of the time, by the time they reach Newfoundland, um, they're done. <laughs> now, they create a bit of a biological wake because a lot of animals swim with them and move with the ice through the environment. And we can see animals as big as, you know, humpback whales off Labrador and Newfoundland. And sometimes we're so, so lucky um, to see them. In fact, I've been so close to a humpback whale that its giant tail fluke actually came down across the dome of my camera. Very, very close. Now, the seafloor is incredibly colorful. And even though the water is minus 1.8 C, um, we still see beautiful life that to some people looks tropical, but it's not, it's very cold. 
um, but stunningly beautiful. Now for teachers, if you wanna see more about the Arctic, um, then definitely check out Under Thin Ice on the Nature of Things, that's my film. It streams for free on CBC Gem or Curio in your classrooms, so check it out. So these icebergs, as they're being reshaped and moving down into Newfoundland now, to me, these are endangered species because we'll never see them again. They're, they'll melt and be gone. And underwater, we see the signs of melting. We see the ice actually fizzing as it melts. And you can hear it underwater fizzing as it melts. It's really, really beautiful, the sculptural quality of these icy environments. But we have to remember that, again, these are endangered environments. Like it's like somebody left the fridge door in the Arctic open and it will affect the climate that is changing all over our planet. So I feel very privileged to see these incredible places and see how they're carved by the hand of the sea. Sometimes we take some of these little uh, bergy bits home with us and we actually break it up and use it as ice in our cocktails in the evening. <laughs> But again, one last look at this ice underwater to see the stunning beauty. So as these icebergs melt away in Newfoundland, we have other things to look at there. The landscape is stunningly beautiful, but we also see shipwrecks underwater. So these shipwrecks were, sh were sunk by German U-boats, submarines, in 1942. And these shipwrecks were carrying a very high grade of iron ore, that was critical for the shipbuilding efforts back in World War II. So this is actually a defensive deck gun on the back of one of these ships that was sunk. So today, these are war graves and they are also artificial reefs because as you can see, life likes to attach to shipwrecks underwater and it becomes an amazing artificial reef. Now, in Newfoundland, besides looking at these incredible shipwrecks and the life on top of them, we um, also find artifacts. Now, we leave everything underwater. We don't bring like biological material out of the water. We don't bring shells out of the water and we don't bring artifacts out of the water. These all need to stay where they were found. On occasion, it takes many years for us to get a permit to bring something out of the water for a museum on request, like in this case, a sextant from a shipwreck that might have otherwise disappeared and it will be displayed in a museum. So that's really, really important. Everything stays in place. Now in Newfoundland, we can also look at the very first mines that happened in Bell Island at the ocean level where they were taking ore out of Bell Island. And you can walk around there today and see some of the remains of the mine itself. We can also go like inland in Bell Island and actually go inside the um, mine itself and swim through these passages that are now flooded. And we can actually see like the industrial archeology, span like the machinery and the equipment that was left inside these mines when the mines flooded. And these mines are actually in the island, but then stretching out underneath the seafloor. That's incredible to imagine that all of this is underneath the seafloor in a place called the Tickle between Bell Island and Newfoundland. So in these mines, we find the machinery, but we also find interesting inscriptions on the wall that miners might have painted with the soot on their own cap lamps. So really, really interesting opportunity to be able to see uh, what was a working mine uh, just over 50 years ago. Now, the third coast, let's move inland in the Great, uh, in the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway and into the Great Lakes to the place where I learned to dive in Tobermory, Canada. Uh, it's a cool little town that's uh, uh, really, its roots are fishing village. And today it's a national park and also an underwater national marine protected area where we can look at some pretty incredible shipwrecks that are well intact, wooden shipwrecks that are underwater, well preserved, 150 to 200 years old. And uh, we have a chance to see them in what are today quite clear waters. 
Now, on many of these shipwrecks, what you will see is uh, a covering, this little nubby stuff, that's invasive species. So that is zebra and quagga mussels that actually came from the Caspian Sea on, in the ship ballast and have ended up in the Great Lakes and made an incredible impact. Not a good one on the Great Lakes, other than the fact that the Great Lakes are clearer and underwater photographers and sightseers enjoy it, but it's not good for the environment necessarily. But it's pretty incredible to see Canada's maritime past. And there are over 35,000 shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. I've had a chance to dive on some as like the first visitor to shipwrecks. So people find shipwrecks like this deep one in Lake Ontario using side scan sonar. And sometimes I get a chance to jump in the water. And in this case, go down 260 feet to sh shoot the first photographs on this particular shipwreck. And you can see that even at 260 feet deep, it's covered with zebra mussels as well. So that's the boiler from that particular shipwreck. Pretty cool. So also in the Great Lakes watershed is a cave system. So not too far from me is Canada's longest underwater cave system at over 10 kilometers long. The visibility isn't great in there. This is one of the best days I've ever seen in there, um, but it's a very important cave. Um, and you can see here's that spot where we just were. And then off to the side, there's another entrance very close, uh, but there's many, many entrances into this cave system. And I'm actually looking at endangered species inside this cave uh, in the form of, of native mussels, bivalves. And these are really um, important animals to the health of the watershed. This is a plain pocketbook mussel. And as you can see, it looks like there's a minnow sitting on it. It's not a minnow. It's actually the flesh of the mussel itself. This is a female animal and it has grown this fish-like lure that it will vibrate. It'll actually flick that tail looking thing and attract a fish. And a fish will nip at the tail, and when it does, the mussel sprays its babies, microscopic shells, at the young fish. And the microscopic shells, glochidia they're called, attach to the flesh and the gills of the fish. The fish swims around for a few weeks until its immune system gets a little bit tired of these, these hitchhikers, and it sheds them. They bury themselves in the silt for a couple of years before re-emerging and start their life cycle as an adult mussel. So the mussels and the fish need to cooperate in order to reproduce the freshwater mussels. So it's a really important and interesting relationship for me to be documenting in those caves. Now, last but not least, the West Coast. The West Coast has lots of shipwrecks too, um, this one is covered with plumos anemones, these beautiful white puff balls of life. And there's a lot of color in the West Coast as well, like this Puget Sound king crab, top to bottom in the frame. He's easily disguised because everything is so colorful. And there's a lot of, you know, fish and things that seem to have no fear of us, no reason to fear us. And they'll swim right up to my dome to say hello. And you know, everything on the seafloor in British Columbia is colorful. These are strawberry anemones all over the rocks. And um, you know, even the urchins are colorful there. So stunning, stunning environment of very strange and interesting animals. But besides these, we have very big charismatic animals like stellar sea lions and California sea lions that are quite curious about us and sometimes even swim right up to us to say hello. They're quite um, orally fixated. They nip and tug at our gear and I've even had them steal the fins off my diving partner. But believe me, it's really fun. It's kind of like a pack of puppies, uh, you know, running up to you, except they swim up to you and they get a little bit rough sometimes as they're kind of tasting and pushing you around and checking you out. Um, but they never hurt us. And uh, the encounter, you know, always leaves me smiling. So I think this is a great place to stop and open it up to some questions. And it could be general questions about diving or my explorations or about places 
to dive in Canada because I've actually been to every province and territory and had a chance to jump in the water. So let's uh, do that. Jill, thank you so, so much. Not only is your, your adventurous life unparalleled in, in our broadcast, but your willingness and enthusiasm of sharing it. Such amazing images, story, all of this. I mean, honestly, most broadcasts, I spend the time doing stuff in the background, getting ready for other things. And yours, <laughs> I just sit with my jaw agape, looking at everything you, you have to share. Um, <laughs> especially, I learned something new every single time we have you on. So thank you so, so Excellent. much. Excellent. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, we've got 150 uh, individuals, groups uh, on YouTube already, plus our live classes. So hundreds and hundreds of kids across North America. In. And uh, as Jill said, I want to dive in with questions. We've got 20 minutes, lots of time to learn a lot. Um, and so I'm going to kick us off with Miss Kaufman's class. So Miss Kaufman's joining us today in uh, Howard Central. Uh, if you guys want to come on in for a question, go for it. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you, Jill? Hi, great, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions around the biggest shipwreck that you've explored. Oh, wow, uh, ooh, good question. Um, you know, I don't know. I think some of the really big ones that I've, I've been on, I mean, the ones in Newfoundland are quite large, uh, but some of the biggest ones I've been on have been down in Micronesia in a place called Truck Lagoon. Those are pretty big too. Um, I'm honestly going to have to look back in my log, but, but some shipwrecks are, you know, well over 400 feet long, meaning it's very difficult to even begin to look at them in a single dive. Yeah. Great question, guys. And if you want to check out Truck Lagoon, uh, Jill's done a program with us on that topic. So if you check out our Exploring by the Seat Your Pants YouTube channel, you'll see that if you want to see a little bit about that special place. Of course, today, diving in with Underwater Canada in such a special way. Uh, but great stumping first question, Ms. Coffin. Uh, <laughs> let's head to Mr. Marker's class. They're joining us today in Sudbury. Uh, if you want to come on in, go for it. <laughs> sure. Thanks again. What a great presentation, Jill. Um, I'm glad to see that you got scared a little bit when you encountered polar bears, but when I look at the things you do, I'm just wondering what you consider the most risky dives and how do you deal with your fears and anxieties when you're diving in the mine shafts and down deep water caves? I'm so glad you asked that question because that actually is the number number one question. People think that I'm fearless and I am not fearless. I'm scared all the time. <laughs> and I think it's really important. I want to dive with people that are also scared because it means that we care about what we're doing. We understand we're taking risks and we care about the outcome. So fear leads to discovery. If we can find out ways to face our fear carefully. So um, if you feel that like, yeah, awful feeling in the pit of your stomach, it's because you're doing something new that you've never done before. So you just have to figure out how to safely do that so that you can be an explorer too. But fear is definitely what triggers exploration. So I, I like to tell young people, especially, you know, when you go to a roller coaster, you're actually a little bit scared to jump on that roller coaster and it makes you feel a little bit queasy, right? But then you get on there and immediately you turn that into woohoo excitement, right? So we all have the capability to turn fear into excitement, discovery, and something new for ourselves. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, you know, things that I do where I do face a lot of risk, but I prepare, I train well, I work with a team and, and I embrace that fear. <laughs> Jill always loves this question. I always love getting it from one of our teachers. It's pretty much a universal in all your broadcasts and it, it, it's sort of the, the essence of something that we get from a lot of our explorers around the world. A lot of kids ask about the preparation that goes into these things and it's so much of the adventure when you're planning an expedition, the prep is the biggest it can be years in some cases and so i'm really glad we got a chance to highlight that so thank you mr markwick um miss brown's class joining us in guelph if you want to unmute your mic you're good to go hi they they have a couple questions one of the questions was um did you ever find any treasures in the shipwrecks that you've um explored and where is your favorite place that you have visited to go diving Ooh, okay. Um, well, we do find a lot of things that I would consider like treasure, um, but they're all they're all things that are important artifacts. And so it's not something like we take and cash in on, right? <laughs> These are things that end up in, in museums. Um, the only time that I kept something that sort of treasure-like 
that I found underwater it was on a fairly recent shipwreck. The ship had only been down about 20 years. And when I was like swimming around in what was the captain's cabin, I reached into the top of the closet and I felt something squishy and I pulled it out and it was a wad of cash. <laughs> so that was pretty amazing. Um, a lot of it fell apart because it had been underwater for 20 years, but we did salvage $320. So um, yeah, that's treasure. I think my favorite place to dive, that's a really tough question. Um, if I had one country to dive in, it would definitely be Canada because of the variety and the wonder. And really, I would say the resilience of the underwater places compared to some of the other areas in the planet based on climate change. My favorite cave though, I think is probably in the Bahamas because it's quite pretty with a lot of stalactites and stalagmites. But go Canada, how exciting is that having this international experience and seeing that yeah. like the Hara desert pit in the desert where it's yeah. one of the coolest places. So uh, I'm glad for our Canadian kids today that this is your mm -hmm. choice. Um, let's take some from YouTube and then we'll go back to our live classes in a minute. Mm -hmm. So Miss Wiken's kindergarten class wants to know, what has been your favorite animal to interact with on a dive show? Oh, it's really hard to beat those stellar sea lions. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they're just so much fun. Um, so I do like that sort of charismatic big life. <laughs> but I also love, um, you know, the jellyfish, like swimming inside a bloom of millions of jellyfish is kind of like being inside an Ikea bouncy ballroom. So that was pretty fun. <laughs> I'm sure they'd appreciate that linkage. I, I, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and great picture behind you again, by the way. Thanks. Awesome. Um, Ms. Arnone's Great Fours want to know, what's the most important supplies you have to have when you dive? The most important supplies? Oh, the gas <laughs> that I breathe. <laughs> so my life support system is really, really important. And um, we actually carry redundant extra life support systems. So because I'm going in an overhead environment like a cave or under the ice, I need to have a complete backup in case the first one breaks down. And generally I have three times as much gas as I plan on using with me. So that if something goes wrong, um, I have a backup, but I also have the ability to bring my buddy home as well. So that's what we call the rule of thirds. So one for me, uh, one for emergency and one to get my buddy home. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I always, again, like when it goes into diving, it's the, sort of the ultimate example of prep. Sort of like when you go up into the space station, all the work that goes into making sure everyone is safe in as many possible ways. Uh, we get this when we talk to astronauts as well, and it's mm -hmm. nice to see in the aquanautical world. Yeah. Um, let's head back to Ms. Kaufman's class for a live question. If you want to come on back in, just unmute that mic. You're good to go. Hey, Ms. Kaufman. Perfect. Um, when you talked about the icebergs fizzing, why do they fizz? Mm. Fantastic question. So imagine that that iceberg started as an ice sheet on top of Greenland. So the, the ice and snow actually kind of flow downhill as glaciers do. Eventually they reach the ocean and they sort of hang out over the ocean and then boom, they break off. And when they break off, that's when they become an iceberg. So it's an ice sheet and then it's an ice shelf and then it's an iceberg. But the formation of all of that ice happened over tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Snow falls down and it builds up over time. And for anyone that's played in the snow, you know that sometimes it's really dense, thick ice, right? But sometimes it's soft and fluffy and there's a lot of air spaces in there. So it's all laid down in layers year after year after year. And it kind of gets compacted from the weight of the ice and snow on top of it. But then when it's in the ocean, all those little air spaces um, need to escape. So the fizzing is actually air from 10,000 or 15,000 or maybe 100,000 years ago, escaping back into the environment again. What a cool and unique perspective on this ability to sort of understand climate from these ice cores and, and ice sheets mm -hmm. in general. Uh, we've had glacier programs on in the past and it's so amazing to be able to like dive into the like distant past with something that we can just go and explore and grab a sample of it and see this mm -hmm. live levels. So neat. Um, Mr. Markwick, come on back in for another question and uh, take us away. 
Sure. Uh, thanks again for having us. Um, so what do you consider to be the most risky dives? Is it going under sea ice or is it going into shipwrecks or? I think my most dangerous dive uh, was about 20 years ago when I was the first person to go cave diving inside an iceberg. <laughs> so I went to Antarctica to meet up with the largest iceberg in recorded history and had promised National Geographic that my team and I would be the first people to go cave diving in these tunnels, these spaces inside the ice. But as you know already from my presentation, the ice is changing, it's breaking, it's calving. Um, and what we discovered in Antarctica is there's some pretty strong currents in these tunnels. So um, it's extremely challenging. And uh, we actually uh, were trapped inside an iceberg, sort of clawing our way out because the current got so strong in Antarctica. So I think that's probably between that and the polar bear, some of the most dangerous experiences that I've been involved in. I would say so. Has anyone else ever done this since you did it? Or? Uh, it, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, there's been like 12 people on the surface of the moon and Jill's the only person to do that ever in history, which is very, very cool. So <laughs> thank you, Mr. Margaret, for that question. Uh, Ms. Brown, I'm coming to you in two seconds. I just want to take this one from Ms. Uh, yeah, Hiscox on YouTube. She wants to know, how do you get out to your exploring sites in the Arctic? These places look very remote and uh, what does it take to get there? Yeah, there's quite a lot of work to get up to the Arctic. So we, we fly from Ottawa, we go through Iqaluit, which is which is the capital of Nunavut. And then from there, we get in a very small plane and we actually sort of hop through small communities to go to places like Arctic Bay or P Pond Inlet. And then from there, we meet with our indigenous guides that take us using snowmobiles and traditional Kalmatic sleds. Uh, and that's when we go out and establish base camps um, on top of the ice. But as you can see, there were a lot of steps to get to the Arctic. So when we go there for photography and expeditions, we have to do that. But imagine that's how food has to get to the Arctic and supplies and goods. They only get a ship once a year. So people in small communities, the cheapest way to get their food is to get it on the annual sea lift into their community, but they have to make their food order or their lumber order, their supplies order a year and a half in advance so that it will arrive in the ship when the sea ice melts in wow. the summer. Otherwise things have to come in by aircraft and it's very expensive. Expensive to the point of $45 for a tin of Tim's coffee, $70 for a case of water, um, $25 for a head of lettuce, um, that's what people in the Arctic have to deal with. I'm really happy you linked that in. We've actually done a program called Food Security in the Frozen North, which is one of our biggest, most popular programs and are really mm. talking about exactly this, that the sort of situation that we have uh, in Southern Ontario or wherever our students are joining from, you can go to the grocery store, get all these things cheap, and there's tons of supply chains and they're recycled every day, um, is not the case in a lot of communities in, in Canada's north and beyond. And I think it's really important for kids to know that. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That segue. Um, Miss Brown's class, come on in, guys. I uh, will take some questions for you and then we'll go to YouTube for a few more to wrap us up because time flies and you're having fun and we're near the end of the broadcast. So come on in, Miss Brown. <laughs> hey, so we have two more questions. One mm -hmm. student wondered if you've ever got hurt um, on any of your diving expeditions. And another student wondered if, other than the sea lions, have you touched any of the um, the underwater creatures that when you are diving or do you kind of just look at them and and yeah. take pictures great um yes i did once suffer a case of decompression sickness so that's a diver's injury now imagine when we go underwater um there's pressure on our bodies and anybody that swam to the bottom of a swimming pool might have felt that pressure in their ears now we're able to equalize the pressure in um in our ears and sinuses and things like that but when we're down underwater, our body stores inert gases, tiny, tiny little bubbles. We use oxygen to fuel our bodies, but there's other com components of our breathing gases and those get stored in our tissues. So we become kind of like a, a can of soda, right? Um, there's little bubbles that are dissolved into the liquid of our bodies. Now, if you release the pressure from a can of soda very quickly, it would fizz, right? Well, the same thing can happen to your body if you come up too quickly. Like oftentimes we have to take a very staged, slow ascent back to the surface. And if I come up too fast, those 
tiny bubbles can come out of the tissues and fizz inside my body and cause something called decompression illness. So I did have that happen to me um, about 20 years ago, but I recovered okay. And now in terms of marine life and interaction with marine life, we try to never have a negative effect on marine life. So we don't want to chase it. We want to allow it to come to us. So we might go underwater and park ourselves at the bottom and hope that a walrus swims on top of us basically, but we never chase it. First of all, we can never catch it. Second of all, we don't wanna stress the animal and we don't wanna to touch them. Um, now there are some occasions where animals are quite frisky <laughs> and they touch first, right? <laughs> and so like I've had manatees come boof, like, you know, bump right into me before and then roll over and rub up against me because they want me to scratch under their flipper. Uh, so there's instances like that where I'm like, hey, I'm not supposed to touch you, but <laughs> nobody told the manatee. Um, but overall, we try to have as little impact as possible on the marine life. Thanks for that. Great, great message, but it would be so much fun to scratch a manatee under the arm. That sounds like a hoot. <laughs> um, well, we'll avoid that, but sounds great. Yeah. Um, I want to end with one more question. I, I think you would know this from your logbook, but it, I'm sure it's in the thousands. Uh, Miss Delio's class wants to know, how many times have you gone diving in your whole life? Well, over 7,500 dives um, that I've done to this point in my life. It's been a slow year because of COVID. I've still been diving, but not traveling as actively as, as usual. So I'm kind of looking forward now that I've had my two vaccines on board to... <laughs> move back into the expedition life a bit more. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, we certainly hope you get out as soon as possible. We look forward yeah. to more adventures from you. And what a fantastic program today, Jill. Thank you so, so much. Thanks. My pleasure. I want to highlight, you highlighted some of these during your presentation, but just for people who want to keep learning going at home, uh, intotheplanet.com, Jill's website, you can see about her book for adults, Into the Planet, her book for kids, The Aquanaut, amazing stuff. Uh, Into the Planet's a really fantastic read. It's on my shelf behind me, so hopefully you guys get the chance to read that if you're keen. Um, and if you want to see her amazing documentary, Under Thin Ice, she mentioned it is on CBC Gem, a really great additional learning opportunity. Um, to, to keep the excitement going. I also want to bring up really quick our Ocean Week Canada website. So this is just the general Ocean Week Canada, another program with Jill tomorrow, all sorts of our Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants programs and more opportunities to get excited about the seas around us. Uh, Jill, is there any last message you want to leave kids with before we wrap the broadcast today? Oh, no, just get out and explore because, you know, when you get into the water, you're going to want to pr protect it too and everything that lives in it. And if I missed some of your questions today, you can reach me at intotheplanet.com and send me a question or send me a picture or a story or anything. <laughs> How cool is that? Well, I certainly want to do that at the end of the broadcast, find out more about that manatee scratching. Um, I hope you guys do too. Thank you so much to all our teachers for joining today. And Jill, as you know what we're going to do to end the broadcast, like all our broadcasts, I'm going to bring in our teachers. So Ms. Brown, Ms. Coffin, Mr. Margaret, you guys can join me in saying a big thank you and farewell 